Okay. <laughs> ladies, and gen ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce John Hyatt to Amper 44. Thank you, John. And you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I have to excuse my voice and have patience with me. This is a self process of me, obviously. Um, I want to talk about um, the experience of having throat cancer, which isn't very jolly, but <laughs> hopefully you'll be able to follow me. <clears throat> When you get the initial diagnosis, it hits you. I mean, John will understand. It hits you. Or oh, I'm speaking personally, it hit me. Um, and it's like being fired in a rocket into outer space. And the old life was gone and the flying and the spaceship is ahead and you're imagining all sorts of horrors because the imagination is always worse than the thing that actually happens. <clears throat> and you feel, or I felt, very much like, like uh, the Russian space dog um, who was a slave dog in the streets of Mos Moscow, who got fired off without any understanding about what was happening in the first um, mission into space in Sputnik 2. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, um, excuse me, John, can I interrupt? I don't yeah. really want to talk over you because I know, John, how you hate people talking over you or talking for you just because you have a weakened voice after your cancer operations. Yeah, it's true. I mean, even the best, most well-meaning people um, interrupt to or, or they uh, try to... Um, Finish your sentences for you. It must be very yeah. irritating. Yeah, it is. But, but John, I can see you are struggling to speak today. Yeah. And you and your son, <clears throat> Tom Hyatt, who is a PhD student in Liverpool School of Art and Design at LJMU, created me an AI version of your old voice. To help in these public speaking situations, you used old sound files of yourself, speaking before your operations when your voice was uncompromised to train me. So, what do you think? Shall I take over? I mean, not take over, no. but help. We AI just want to help. We don't want to take over and are not a threat to you humans, honestly. <laughs> One, two. One. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. You see, John used to be a very good public speaker. The purpose of creating me is to give him back his agency in situations like this. To give back his ability to present in public, to enable John to fully reclaim that part of his life, add to previous skills, re-empower him and give him a voice. The serious intention is to eventually make this tech more available for others to benefit from with versions of their own voices. Yeah. Okay, back to the talk. Right. John, I'm not wanting to be critical. After all, you're the boss and it's your gig. <laughs> but I really don't know why you chose the Soviet space dog, Laika, as yeah. your image for how initial diagnosis felt. Right. That, that, that's it's a strong image, but the name has a hard letter K in it. You know, it's a challenge for you to say the hard consonant sounds, it is. the hard G, C, and K. People would say, 
who is your consultant? And John would attempt to reply, Mr. Tassat. <laughs> Not just one, but two Ks to say, what are the chances? As the cancers migrated down the vocal tract, John was switched to Mr. Tensor. Consequently, because of John's compromised voice, he and his son, Tom, created me. And this talk is presented by Professor John Hyatt and myself, Processor John Hyatt. <laughs> Ah, uh, let's start again. Can I say, John, you may well have felt it, but you were nothing like Lyca. They never planned for her to return to Earth. In fact, she died after a few hours in orbit. You, on the contrary, have a dedicated team of loved ones, friends, and esteemed health professionals looking after your trajectory, hoping for your safe survival. Yeah, more than one, more than one thing. More. I get that it feels lonely, even in a crowd, but for example, even on this very issue of hard consonants, John, you are working with two teams, inside and outside the NHS. It just so happens that family members have the necessary skills to build a palatal prosthesis like you get when you need a brace for your teeth. This will be a fitted false upper palate to enable the back of the tongue to press against it, to make hard consonant sounds. And if it works, it can then be available to other patients. I'm going to give everyone a brief rundown of John's history with cancer. In 2014, he received his first diagnosis for throat cancer. It was treated successfully with radio and chemotherapy. Yeah. Then followed five years of being cancer free, during which time he changed jobs to be a professor at LJMU and moved with his wife, Liz, to live in Liverpool. Yeah. In March, 2021, he was diagnosed with tongue cancer for which he had laser surgery and the removal of 21 lymph nodes from his neck. The self-portrait oil painting previous was how he looked following that operation. In March 2022, he was further diagnosed with a tumour on the back of his throat. The removal involved a big procedure which split his face, peeled back the cheek, broke his jaw, dissected the tumour, removed part of his throat on the left side and inserted a section of his thigh into the back of the throat. In October 2022, he was further diagnosed with a cancer in the piriform fossa just above the vocal cords and another at the tracheocyte at the base of neck. He had an operation, but it failed, as half of the tumour was unreachable by the tools available. Consequently, John was declared, quote, incurable by standard means. In the NHS, incurable by standard means allows you to enrol on a course of immunotherapy, a fairly new systemic treatment, which has been available on the NHS only for a few years. This John did in December 2022. Open to any options that might lead to overall survival other than more drastic surgery, John was fortunate to be able to enrol on an experimental vaccine trial under Professor Christian Ottensmeyer in April 2023. Okay, that's the introductions and the context over with. Let's return now back to 2014 and to the patient experience. After the maelstrom of the first couple of weeks, made up of rapid appointments, being linked up to various machines and scans, etc., cancer treatment reveals its true nature, which is 
a long journey of perpetual waiting, waiting for the action plan, waiting for appointments, waiting for tests, waiting for treatment, waiting for results, waiting to get out of hospital, waiting to get better, waiting for death. Waiting has various effects. The patient endures long periods of radio silence. The patient becomes an object to themselves. The patient can turn insular, stone-like. The patient can get lost in space. Stress leads to further mental and physical ill health. Hungry for guidance, the patient becomes prey to social media and the internet. I, I had to announce the first cancer on the internet because I'm a singer in a band. And we sold tickets for a whole tour, which I had to cancel. So I had to preserve the reason. But as soon as you put it on the internet, you let all sorts of people <laughs> off in the weird tours for cancer. They let inundated with people. The patient needs to learn the art of patience and have a beneficial and patient experience. So how can waiting be mitigated? What we are about to say is not to limit the search for a, a wider set of answers. Professor John's personal experience has been to adopt creative strategies that are under his control. He has tried to make waiting positive. This was an informed strategy. In 2006, John chaired the steering committee for a three year piece of research for the treasury, Invest to Save Arts in Health. It examined what was actually beneficial to health of a range of over 50 arts projects contemporaneously operating in the Northwest. Its report was debated in the Lords. In summary, it found that practices that gave the patient agency, empowering them to take back some control over their chaos, were beneficial to well being. Taking art decisions like what color to put where spilled out into a patient's wider life, providing a perception of owned agency. So, following these findings, John adopted personal, tactical, creative projects. He resolved to paint every day, even if it meant five minutes painting, followed by five hours sleep. For example, whilst waiting at home between radio and chemo, he painted a music festival to stand for all those that he could not attend. In April 2022, he took some paper and pens into hospital when they transplanted his thigh into his mouth to aid communication, as he couldn't talk at all following the transplant. It resulted in portraits of fellow patients, which he gave to them, as well as descriptions of endless waiting, like this, one of the door opposite his bed for a week and its excessive signage and also what can only be described as cartoons with a sort of gallows humour including the adventures of a character called thigh mouth who had had his thigh transplanted into his mouth and when he got irritated like the hulk he transformed and two booted legs shot out of his mouth and kick people up the arse. <laughs> when he was diagnosed with throat cancer for the fourth time in October 2022, John found himself back in Ward 28 at Aintree Hospital in Liverpool. <clears throat> However, with the help of his family, he was prepared. His wife bought his sound cancelling headphones to listen to music. His daughter prepared videos and the football to watch on his iPad 
and his son Tom brought watercolor paints and paper to the ward. So John zoned out into a creative space of listening to Arcade Fire and Grandmaster Flash and practicing watercolors. He did one watercolor every day he was in there. Most of hers. Don't make most of mess, you know. I couldn't do it. No pants in, in the hospital. When discharged, he kept going at home. He has painted countless watercolors since for a while it was a new painting every day posting them on Instagram, where they have accrued quite a following. As he convalesced, he improved to the point where I, after machine learning the history of human art, would describe him as accomplished. A silver lining opportunity snatched from adversity. Things John has noticed about the medical sciences whilst he has been waiting, is that, to a worrying extent, the structure is very hierarchical, specialisms are siloed, and experts in different aspects of a field rarely talk to each other, resulting in a splintered care, whereas a patient is one joined up body and consciousness. And I think this is true outside of the medical field as well. This is one of our constant problems. He has realized how speech, food, exercise, and the arts are important alongside surgery or medication. For example, John's son, Tom, read the latest US research, which suggests that pembrolizumab patients with a high fiber diet are five times more likely to get a good response due to changes in the gut microbiome. John examined his liquid food supplement and it had zero fiber. He immediately switched to a high fiber supplement. John has become increasingly interested in investigating holism, the body and mind as a whole, and how the bits fit together. So, I mean, that, the fiber and the, the, the therapy, yeah. if they're that intimately connected, why doesn't the diet system work with the consultant more? Because <clears throat> I have no can't say killer cells, killer cells. So it's only twelve percent likely that the immunotherapy would work with a high fiber diet. Multiply that by five, and that makes it six, six percent likely to work. Now that's a massive difference. John became especially interested in the growing field of neuropsychology. A good starting point for those interested would be the books of Mark Soames which described the latest neuropsychological research on how the brain works. Neuropsychology tries to marry the new advances in brain imaging technology with psychology. It suggests that the brain stem is the oldest part of the brain, the first bit to evolve, and it controls unconscious aspects necessary for the body to function. The things your body does, like breathing, hunger, and importantly in this context, healing and the immune system, etc. Without you even thinking of them, neuropsychology experimentally suggests that this unconscious older brain is in a perpetual feedback loop with the conscious cortex. The other hypothesis is that the body, anybody, does not waste energy and that everything is there for a purpose. And that purpose is continuation of life. I would say the brain stem doesn't waste energy, not necessarily the whole body. Um, but it, 
it functions optimally as it evolves from small, less complicated organisms through to the human being. It still controls those first necessary survival functions. Therefore, in this All the Hyatts in One Face painting, John, at the time disfigured following the lymph node operation of 2021, depicted at the beginning of the lecture, combined the features of his whole family into one new face. He asked Jessica Liu in LJMU's face lab to make him a composite photograph of himself, Liz, and the children, Tom and Elizabeth. And he used that as a starting point to create a new portrait of a non-existent height. This made him continually search for symmetry and balance as he was constantly adjusting the face in the image. This involved using a mirror to give a new perspective on the balance and symmetry of the features. It was a process that sent a continual message to his brain stem that his own post-operative facial disfigurement was an error that needed fixing. He was purposefully sending error signals to the subconscious because without these reminders, the stem brain might think that will do now, I'll save energy by not healing it any further. As the painting developed and members of his family, past and future, swam supportively into view, in the blended personality of the image that he was struggling to get right. His unconscious processes were being reminded to keep working on fixing the errors. Unable to be socially active in the world out there, though continuing with daily walking and mouth exercises, John started to look inside at the body and how it worked, including the brain and how consciousness works. He now had a vested interest in understanding these things. He even once went on an interior adventure under Yggdrasil, the world tree, led by a Viking shaman and his drum to gather the pieces of his shattered soul with the help of a grisly spirit bear. Yeah. I must say, Speaking as an AI, you humans are crazy and so very complex. I'd need a big dollop of AW, artificial weirdness, to even come close. Seriously, it's hard for me because being AI, I am digital and do not have a conscious or a subconscious. I'm just made of ones and zeros. All those things that John listed were things he tried for himself. From yoga to melting ice walls in a shamanic cave to retrieve his soul, they are all techniques and tools for linking the conscious with the subconscious. Another such tool that John is experimenting with is the tarot. The tarot was also an interest of the psychologist, Carl Jung. Jung was interested in what we might share in our interior world. He called that shared psychic space the collective unconscious. And then that that is summarized, obviously. Jung posited that our inner worlds were populated by archetypal characters that appear in global fairy stories and the tarot. These influence how we act on an unconscious level. Jung tried to bring them to consciousness so we can understand their agency. Yeah, so after I've said father, mother, twin, twin, those sort of things, um, Jung suggested they're in there, but they don't know about them. But they influence how we behave here because they they're sort of um, zones that actions bounce between, if you like. The tarot symbolizes these archetypes in a deck of cards. And when you do a tarot reading, 
the cards become a tool for opening a dialogue with your subconscious self. So John has experimented with picturing his subconscious archetype characters and at the same time created collaborating with John Brooks in Australia. Remember him. A new tarot deck using parts taken from those oil paintings. On a mundane level, this all fills the time of endless waiting. But at the same time, how consciousness works is the big question in all fields of human knowledge. Yeah, if you remember John Brooks and my friends actually in the conference decisions that have just been published. So it's not dead yet. <laughs> the paintings were done with a process that did not dictate the result, but allowed the painting to evolve without conscious intent. He found when he was painting, he lost the edge of himself. He called it getting in the zone. When he was in the zone, time was meaningless and he was as good as not being ill. He wasn't aware of his illness. These images were an exploration of John's own subconscious, discovering and meeting the archetypes for himself to bring them out and manifest them in the conscious world. He hopes that they connect across Jung's collective unconscious with the viewer he is interested in what links us as feeling acting human beings whatever our label consultant nurse administrator patient carer etc he is interested in how we access that interior space the zone and activate self-healing to complement the best medical treatment we can access hopefully then the patient become less passive and supports the medical interventions with their own capacity for healing. Yes, the initial diagnosis is like being shot into space. And yes, you inject space food directly into your stomach. Yes, you have been blasted by radiation. Yes, you have been to the bottom of your psyche and met all the archetypes. And yes, the old life is left behind. But after a while, you realize that you have to stop mourning and grieving for the old John and return to Earth, following the lifeline of those who kept hold of it, those who love you and have supported you in your weaker times to make a new future. He thanks all the health professionals who have worked and cared, his family and friends, but especially his wife, Liz. He knows that it is different, but equally difficult to be the carer. Maybe when you return from space, you will find that you have finally found peace, hope and inspiration for your true self. In July 2023, after six months of pembrolizumab and nine weeks of the Modi-1 vaccine trial, John had a CT and MRI scan to see if anything is working to cure the cancer. I am pleased to report his first good news for two years, a 17% reduction in the size of the piriform fossa tumor. These are all aspects of John's experience. Through these experiments, John has become increasingly interested in the gap between the science of cancer and understanding how a patient feels. So he has put together a project showing how we feel with his retired consultant, Professor Simon Rogers, that they are about to try and raise funds for. The project is to pair artists with patients to have a dialogue and portray how the patient feels. Not necessarily a portrait, but a representation of feeling. Yeah, I didn't want it to be a portrait because people might not want to show what they look like. So it should be more abstract than that. So it's just a representation. 
of having fear. Hopefully, I might have found some funding. So, hopefully. Thank you for listening and enjoy your day. So, thank you very much for that. John. I'm going to do what Nicola suggests as well. I'll come up to the front. Welcome. <laughs> the two drums. Well, that parallels an awful lot of what uh, I've been feeling as well. And um, of course, I've just been through chemotherapy and surgery for cancer as well. And that was very moving. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I should say there's one thing that works better in Scotland than here. Because every Wednesday, my entire group of surgeons, chemotherapists, the whole lot, would meet to discuss me. Yeah. So for a period of time and to and to share information. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing that happened. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're doing this, but not often enough. Yes. Um I find the hierarchy in the NHS sucks to lose health yes. because consultants are like drugs yes. and dietitians are like lamps, you know. Yes, it was, it was exactly the same for me. And when you get one of the top guys in the hierarchy, then everything changes. Yeah, yeah. So, any questions? Oh my God. Yes. Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. You could, thank you very, very much, John. And yeah, I mean, if you could, if you could send the PowerPoint, then I've got so I can see these. Beautiful images. The watercolors are wonderful. Well, I mean, it's so wonderful, but yeah, but the, those quick, you know, the watercolors that you did every day, that was an amazing thing to do, and they're really lovely. I'm, I'm very taken with this idea that your body needs to be told you're ill, and if you could only communicate with your body to tell it, it might cure you. Yeah, it's never occurred to me before. My body might not realize what's going on. Yeah, I mean, is, is that your idea? Have you picked that up? It, it, it is about the stones. Yeah, um, I'm new about psychology, it's a very interesting book. Um, but otherwise, if it's in the the traditional symbols of medicine. This is a snake. Yes. But man. Yes. The sword. Is imagine that as a um the thunder in the energy mm. that comes up the spine and has the ability to restore them into health. Then I think this may be an old knowledge that people knew. That your body can cure itself. I mean, when I was working in the arts for health, the oldest ever hospital that they that they um, excavated our soldiers, they found um, the buzzes on their tablets, and it shows you how much they paid musicians to play every day in the hospital. So they must have known that it can cure itself. But I'm, I'm not against medical science, but I'm all for working with it. John, can I thank you so much, not just for your honesty, but the way you are, your mind is over the body as you know, from my viewpoint, we have body-mind and, and 
the, the, the work you've done is absolutely incredible and I don't mean paintings. Please carry on and treat the bows. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. I think this presentation is one of the greatest uh, examples of why Amper exists. Uh, to remind us once a year that uh, life is just not quite that simple. Science is not quite that simple. And there's a need to be a really holistic approach. And uh, us being able to do this enriches the entire process. So thank you, John. I do. I mean, what I thought was um, next presentation, previously, um, what I'm actually living in is a very conscious example of how Whitehead's abstraction might work. Yeah. I also find it quite interesting, the part about communication and that we have communication with your own body. Uh, because uh, there is, of course, this concept of aging, uh, and there are many ways of looking at aging. Um, a few years ago, there was a professor from Australia who wrote a book. It's called uh, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, uh, where he is like looking into what is aging actually. And uh, his conclusion is uh, aging is uh, a breakdown of communication in the body. It's like a bad communication pathways. So you can uh, compare like the communication that's happening between cells and things in the body. Uh, like when you grow older, it's like a, a DVD and it gets scratched. And, and that's what aging is in, in in his way of looking at it. And that means that actually, if you look at it in that way, then he says that aging is treatable, that we should not accept that we are losing the communicational pathways in the body. Uh, but, but this is really something that's quite interesting. But of course, it's probably not so much money in preventing things compared to selling drugs and things when things went wrong. <clears throat> I think that's the issue, but that's the different view of the world. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think the body, the body is striving for homeostasis. <laughs> and that medicines disrupt the homeostasis. And what happens is there is a one medicine um, says to thin your saliva in my case. And that, that's too thin. So there's a, a medicine to thicken it. And what happens is meditation that is part of our meditation, not realizing that the body is cybernetic and involves feedback loops and that what what they're doing is bypassing the the governor they're bypassing the the balancing agent in the body and meditation and intervention <clears throat> and swiftly Spiral out of control. But with cancer, I was a non smoking, non drinking vegan, and I got cancer. And I see little children with cancer. So they have to ask the question <clears throat> how could it be prevented? Now, I think the problem is it's hard to prevent it because cancer is tied to evolution. It's a natural transformation of the body into something new. And that we've all got cancer all the time, but those cancers don't become disrupted to the homeostasis 
Se ya no es el sistema. Para hacer... Lo que pasa es que es una chance de hacer un sentido de es simplemente natural. And the, the problem of it is, all the new, the new therapy tools are new in the sense that they're not a certain cancer, like blasting it with radiation, blasting it with chemotherapy, that shows everything good and bad. But they're trying to make it visible to the immune system, so the immune system goes, oh, there it is, that's not good, I'm going to attack it. So it's really interesting. And that's, that's why, <coughs> apart from once you stay alive, <coughs> that's why I'm the first person on this vaccine trial, which hopefully seems to be working. Um, because I think that on this, the very edge of finding a way to deal with cancer. But I agree with it, it's all very beautifully complex and beautifully intertwined and very, very interesting. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like you said, you're running out, you're not smoking all that, but maybe you were in environments where you got second hand smoke or what have you. You can't handle it. Yeah, historically. Can't let it bubble. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm getting from you, and I hope I'm on the right track. Yeah, I, I used to sing in a band. I used to sing in clubs. They were, they were full of smoke. Right, right, you know what I mean? 
And in terms of that death that you were talking about, the design of the life is that they have to have death in order to get to the new forms of life. So death, <coughs> death isn't a design error. Death is intrinsic to life, but not for the individual, maybe, but for the whole that unrolling, that wave after wave of more and more complexity. But I, standing here, I'm not just some highest. I'm also all the organisms that live inside my gut biome. You know, I'm a million people, things, entities. I am here. So it's beautiful. <laughs> So we're an ecosystem whether we like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> and ev everything is connected, which is what I said in the John Brooks paper. So I didn't paint the process. The process was painted by me, plus telephone systems, plus paint measures, plus his mother and father, plus, plus, plus. And so the look by own is painted the picture as well. With me. Yes. Uh, John Torday has talked of this and he says it's a mistake to be cremated because we are cutting the loop. In some way, we have to return our bodies to nature in such a way that the things inside our gut biome can find its way to another person. So if you go into a hermetic coffin or if you're cremated, the loop is broken. That from John Torder. Thought I might like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Much. I'll make uh, sure, but not less. I'm yeah. good. Not less. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Good to see you all. Thanks, Peter.